So again, I think most of you are familiar with PineMap, which stands for Pine Integrated Network Education, Mitigation, and Adaptation Project, which was funded by the USDA through the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. Many universities involved and, and most of the major co-ops in the region. Uh, the goals of, of PineMap, as dictated by the funding agency, were to bring together existing knowledge and create new knowledge and then disseminate that knowledge uh, to stakeholders to better understand how to increase carbon sequestration in planted pine systems, how to be more efficient with fertilizer, but especially nitrogen, uh, and how to adapt uh, forest management systems uh, to changing climate. In the PIMAP project, we one way we think about what we're doing is to think about outcome fees. Uh, USDA really wanted these projects to focus on outcomes, there to be tight interactions with stakeholders like you uh, to, to produce real world outcomes. And we think about those real world out outcomes in a number of ways. Again, driven to a large extent by what the funding agency wanted, but to think about increased carbon sequestration, to think about supporting public policy that uh, is supportive of sustainable forest management given whatever uh, future climate conditions may be, to provide support for resilient forest-based economy in the region in the future, uh, to educate the pub public in terms of forestry and forestry's and forests' role in their lives and in the region in the future, and also to do a, a couple of things in terms of capacity in the region, to enhance the capacity for collaboration. So I think one thing we're seeing from Pine Map is much better integration among the research cooperatives. That was, was a key thing I think that we're seeing, and there's an enhanced capacity for that, as well as enhanced capacity across the region for collaboration among university researchers as well. And then also to enhance connections. Again, connections among university researchers, but also connections between researchers, extension professionals, and education professionals with their stakeholders. So uh, all of these things are, are important foci of the PineMap project and things we're working towards. In terms of organization, there's, there's about, at any particular time, anywhere from 100 to 120 people involved in the PineMap project and trying to figure out what kinds of organizational structure works to, to keep everyone pulling in the same direction can be difficult. One thing that we do to organize uh, those people is to organize them in terms of integrative research. So we have a number of research areas here uh, which integrate in a number of ways, either integrate spatially across the region, integrate across disciplines, uh, or integrate across research, extension, and education. So we have things in, in, including regional modeling, um, decision support system development, some educational mo modules, uh, some important genetics work, and some regional analysis of field measurements and existing data. So I'm not going to report on all of these, but this is just sort of an idea of the type of work that's going on in Pine Map that really integrates in a number of ways. I'm going to report on a couple of what I think uh, are important integrative areas you might be interested in that are going on in Pine Map. One of those is the climate projections that we're using in Pine Map. Obviously, this is a climate change project, so our starting point are predictions of climate change for the region. And we're using uh, a state-of-the-art climate product, product that we're calling the MACA data set. That stands for Multivariate Adaptive Constructed Analogs, which is basically downscaled global circulation model predictions of future climate. The idea here is that the GCMs, the global climate models, which predict future climate, operate on a very large scale. This is an example of the grid scale for a climate model. And what you can see, for instance, for the southeastern US, there's maybe 
you know, a dozen cells in that GCM grid. What this MACA approach does is take the predictions for each of those cells and using some robust statistical approaches downscales those to much smaller scales. So from um, dozens to hundreds of miles grid scales down to uh, the order of maybe a four mile square grid scale. Um, so these data are downscaled for about 20 different climate models. So it's not just one GCM, it's 20 GCMs. Everyone has their own GCM, and each one does something better. Maybe it does this part of the world better. Maybe it's better at precipitation. This one's better at temperature. So the sort of current approach to using GCMs is to use a whole bunch of them and to look at ranges of climate predictions and also ensemble means. So we're trying to take that approach, and we're downscaling all of those. So we have the output from 20 GCMs downscaled to this four, four mile scale daily. So around six terabytes of, of data, lots of data. And some really good data. Precipitation, maximum air temperatures, wind speed, humidity, and radiation. We chose a data set, and there aren't a lot that include this level of detail, so that we could drive um, our biological process model, 3PG, with uh, the projected climate data. Okay, so these, these data will feed into the pine map models um, and will be available also on our decision support system by, the, you know, by themselves. So if you're interested in just exploring climate data, there'll be an interface where you can say, okay, what will what, are, what do projected temperatures look like in the region from now up to 100 years into the future, um, uh, along with uh, uncertainty estimates as well. So uh, our climatologist colleagues at, at NC State, the state climatologist in North, North Carolina is a co-PI on Pine map, map. They're working hard to sort of digest these many, many terabytes of data, make them available in a usable form, both by themselves and uh, as usable in pine map models as well. So moving on to the, the pine map modeling program, we don't have a single model. We're using a suite of models because, again, just like climate models, forestry models do different things well, as you all know. So we're using Bob App sub-regional regional timber supply model to understand how timber supply and demand might change in the future given different climate and different growth scenarios. Obviously, if, you, if your plantations are growing faster, that's potentially going to have an impact on regional stocks and therefore supply and therefore demand. And Bob's model will help us understand how that might affect timber supply and demand in the future. Bob's model also covers all forests. Okay, so for instance, we'll, we can be able to have an estimate of how total forest carbon might change as, for instance, plantation area expands and natural forest area declines or vice versa, or as area moves into and out of ag. All important, I think, contextual information that really helps us understand what the future might look like. We're using uh, the Forest Service Water Supply Stress Index Model, or WASI model, which is really a water-centric model based on watersheds, but that also uh, predicts carbon dynamics. And we can use that to understand how changes in climate and changes in productivity will affect water supply from watersheds. And, and we can do things like understand trade-offs between carbon sequestration and water availability. Okay, there's always trade-offs. Harold Burkhart's group has developed a regional growth and yield model, which is climate responsive, uh, which I think will be a very valuable output from Pine Map uh, that will be readily available to everybody. And then, like I've already mentioned, we're also using the 3PG model, which is a biologically based model of forest growth, which uh, also outputs um, 
productivity in terms of uh, merchandised volumes of chip and saw, pulpwood, and saw timber as well, thanks to some work that Carlos Gonzalez has done. On. So we have a really nice set of models that we can set on top of those climate projections to understand what the future might look like and what those implications might be in terms of, of risks and opportunities for you. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about some of the other, how the inputs are assembled for these models. It's no small task just to get, to get the input data set, set up to run a regional run uh, for, for instance, a growth and yield model or 3PG. So you have to input soils data. Uh, so uh, the group at Virginia Tech is doing a lot of this work to aggregate uh, the Sergo soils data to the watershed level. So these black lines in the dot are HUC 12 or hydrological unit code uh, watersheds. 12 is the finest resolution. Those are it's a standardized hydrologic unit. The greater number of digits, the smaller the watershed. So this is the finest scale resolution. These watersheds are 10,000 to 40,000 acres. So that's the, the area at which we're resolving soil characteristics. And as you know, any 10,000 acres is perfectly uniform in terms of soils. So those soils data are aggregated up to that, to that level for input to the models. Those MACA downscale climate projections, those are about four mile grid squares. They're actually 16th degree, so they're not exactly four miles. They're a degree of latitude and longitude, which means, of course, the cell sizes vary. But they're in the neighborhood of 10,000 acres. We, so we have all those temperature, precipitation, vapor pressure deficit data in these grid cells. And then you combine those. So you lay those squares on top of the watersheds. And when you lay the squares on top of the watersheds, you get these subcells, which are unique combinations of soils and climate. I think this, just these, this input data set is a huge accomplishment. I think there's a lot of value potentially in just having access to this data set by itself, uh, given sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of soils and future climate data for the southeastern United States. But we will we'll, using this to run then our regional model simulations. The end point of all of this is the development of a, a decision support system uh, for use by uh, forestry professionals uh, in the region, which is our target audience, uh, and to answer their questions in terms of what risks and opportunities there might be in terms of changing climate in the region. And to use Pine Map research, especially some of the modeling and economics research to develop tools for that model. So some of the types of tools that we'll be developing for that decision support system uh, include a germplasm deployment tool. How, given what we know about how our current germplasm uh, responds to climate, how might uh, seed deployment zones change under future climate? How might productivity change? How might risks like hurricane or southern pine beetle uh, risk change given a predicted future climate? So all of these tools are under development, but will be available in a Pine Map decision support system. We're, we're enlisting some of your help to give us feedback on what, what those tools might look like and, and how usable they are for you. So again, the idea is to identify risks and opportunities um, for that decision support system. Really briefly, I want to mention the education activities in Pine Map. Um, I'm really proud of, of the education work that's been done in this project. We have a, a graduate course that's been offered a number of times. So all of the graduate students in Pine Map have taken uh, a consistent course by distance to understand uh, multidisciplinary research and also to understand how research and extension can be integrated. Uh, we have a nice fellowship program where undergraduate researchers work with Pine Map graduate students, uh, and also learn about experiential science education. Um, we also, Martha Monroe has taken the lead on developing a project learning tree module 
uh, based on forests and climate change. That module is now finished and is being pilot tested by teachers uh, throughout the region and is, and is an excellent module. And it will win awards as, uh, as all of Martha's modules have in the past. But this is really an innovative piece of uh, edu educational uh, output that uh, we're very proud of. So uh, when that's available, I will let you know about it. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking with you about our Pine Map corporate outreach plan. So obviously, if we're interested in, in outcomes, one of the things we want to do is communicate with you in terms of what we're doing uh, and what that research means in terms of decisions that you might make in the future. Uh, so I want to talk about how that outreach might work and maybe get some of your thoughts on that plan, what it looks like, and, and what the holes might be so that, I, so that we can use that to, to make this better. So some of the key elements of this outreach plan are to present Pine Map results at co-op meetings. So you, we've already done that, and we've been doing that for a number of years. That includes both sort of overview talks by co-op directors, as well as graduate student research on sort of more focused research associated with Pine Maps, Pine Map. And also, you know, interacting with you about uh, what the missing pieces might be in terms of some of that research. We're going to develop online resources for you in terms of research summaries. So, for instance, we'll take Maxwell's uh, Tier 3 research and produce a, a narrated PowerPoint that will be available across co-ops so that uh, all cooperators can have access to that more detailed uh, biological research that's going on in the different cooperatives, as well as short research summaries uh, for each of those graduate student research uh, projects. And those will be available through the Pine Map website, uh, and you'll be notified of those. We're also thinking about potentially producing podcasts uh, that could be, for instance, listen, you could listen to on your truck radio as you're uh, doing miles on the way to, to field visits. We're not sure whether that would be useful, but that was another thought in terms of how you might use some of this research and access it given your limited time. We're also going to be do, doing online training on tools and data sets. So, for instance, these will be either real-time or, or recorded. Uh, demonstrations on how to use, for instance, the Pine Map Decision Support System, or how to access, for instance, the MACA climate data, and how to use those. So we'll make available these online modules for you or your people to access these resources and use them for your decision making. We're also going to be doing at least one more sub-regional workshop focused on field foresters. Uh, so Eric Taylor has already done one of these in the Western Gulf, where both corporate and non-corporate foresters came together uh, to learn about research associated with resilient forest management um, and how we can uh, approach forest management under climate uncertainty using the principles of, you know, uh, solid forest management and resilient forest stands as a tool for managing for the future. We'd like to put on at least one more of these in the East uh, for, for instance, your field folks. You're certainly welcome, but these are focused more on the folks that are out there making uh, um, you know, uh, prescription decisions for individual stands uh, to help them access Pine Map research uh, and, and focused on them. We'll also have a couple of virtual meetings per year focused on uh, science presentations from some of these integration platforms. So, so maybe a little bit more in-depth science from regional modeling or from genotyping of, of Loblaw Pine. Um, so we'll have some in-depth science available for you to attend online, as well as a virtual rollout of the decision support system. Uh, once we've done some pilot testing, we'll have an online virtual rollout 
of that for you as well. We're also planning a wrap-up conference at the end of 2015 um, that will be virtual, focusing on a number of topics to be determined. And then finally, we'll have a wrap-up symposium at the very end that will be in, per in person to sort of try to bring all of Pine Map's work together uh, and talk about what that means for forest management and maybe do some visioning for the future. The idea is that the virtual meetings will sort of feed into and inform what that in-person uh, wrap-up meeting will look like. We'll probably do a special issue journal at the end, probably associated with that wrap-up symposium, uh, and we'll be doing some DSS, Decision Support System, pilot testing. And finally, we'll also we'll be planning some assessment of this corporate outreach plan um, so that we can understand how effective our interactions with you are. Uh, from uh, an extension perspective. So I'd like to take a minute and, and maybe get your thoughts on the set of outreach tools and activities. Maybe get your thoughts about what you think in terms of what's there. Is anything missing? Uh, is there anything that you'd like to see in terms of outreach or access to tools in the immediate future? So I just saw some emails between the modeling group. So I put the modeling group on the spot and I said, okay, you're going to present some regional modeling output in a week, week from now. And I saw some email between them and North Carolina State saying, can, can we see some of these data so we can get these runs down? Um, so it's really a, the bolus of climate data is huge and, and it's taking a while to chew through it. But certainly by the end of this year, I think the, the, the suite of data will be available at least for, for instance, an IT professional. So we mentioned NetCDF is apparently a, a data sharing protocol. So I don't know that you or I could necessarily go obtain these data, but you could talk to your IT person and they would be able to port these data into your system, for instance. I, I expect by the end of this year. And I'd also like, you know, like I said, I'd like to make available that merged soils and climate data as well. I think that's a really, really valuable resource. <clears throat>